Often when we hear the brand Sega, it brings back many whimsical memories from our glorious gaming past. Sega would play an important role in many people's childhoods, with Sonic the Hedgehog and company making growing up just that little bit more enjoyable. Well, this is certainly the case. As covered on this channel many times before, what went on behind the scenes at the company was not always so rosy. After all, we are more than familiar by this point with how Sega of Japan would often treat Sega of America, with history now showing us that the Trans-Pacific pairing never had a good relationship at the best of times. So, if the people in charge would treat people from the American division of the company poorly, well, what about those who were employed working directly for their Japanese division? To answer this question, it does not seem like they got any preferential treatment either. So, let's discuss how Sega would end up subjecting their own employees to both inhumane and humiliating practices. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the infamous Sega Isolation Room. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. With Valentine's Day coming up, it is very important that you ensure that you trim your rosebush. And what I mean by rosebush is your big hairy balls. Regardless of your relationship status, you should be ready for anything. Feeling your best starts with looking and smelling your best, which is why you need Manscaped. Manscaped have sent me their performance package 4.0, so let's check it out. The Lawn Mower 4.0 comes with cutting edge ceramic replaceable blades, with skin safe technology and an LED light, making all of your shaving escapades that much more comfortable and safe. The 4.0 comes with this lovely wireless charging dock to turn it on, press the button and you'll see the LED light. And that's not all. In your 4.0 package, you will receive one of these Manscaped Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorants and one of these Manscaped Crop Reviver Refreshing Ball Toner. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this one because I had no idea that ball deodorant was even a thing, but it is and it makes a lot of sense because you need to stick this on your balls it stops them from chafing and when you get sweaty balls this stops them from stinking also included within the package is the manscaped weed whacker which is a ear and nose hair trimmer now i'm telling you you need this particular item because from a woman's point of view there is nothing more disappointing and gross than leaning in to kiss someone and they've got loads of hairs crawling out their nose like spiders but manscaped is not just for below the waist or your nose and ears they also have the shears 2.0 a stainless steel six piece nail care kit so for a brief time going forward you will also get the shed travel bag and the anti-chafing boxer briefs what's not to love about that that's a gift on top of a gift break up with your old grooming routine and get the performance package from manscaped don't wait go to manscaped.com and use my promo code decade to get 20 percent off plus free international shipping plus those two free gifts Living here in the West, it is of course common to encounter corporate companies who do not have the best track records when it comes to looking after their staff. But as bad as many of these organisations' practices are, it is rare to find an example of a Western company dishing out abuse to their staff as flagrantly as Sega in this scenario, with the company going out of their way to ensure that unwanted employees suffered as much as possible to punish or get rid of them. 
to be able to understand the somewhat authoritarian nature of the Sega of Japan of the 90s, we have to look at the climate in which Sega found itself in over the period. To grasp this, we need to get a taste of the corporate culture within the company, but to do so, this requires looking at the man who was in charge, Hayao Nakayama. Hayao Nakayama was born in an era when Japan was still an empire with practically zero Western influence. The future head honcho would have an extremely privileged upbringing, whereby all of his direct relatives were medical doctors, with them heavily expecting him to pursue the same career. In a rather shocking move though, Nakayama would drop out of college, ditching the study of medicine, instead opting to take up a job he spotted in a newspaper, whereby he would lease jukeboxes for a living. With a passion for both sales and electronics paired with a strong work ethic, Nakayama would successfully rise within the V&V trading company, eventually heading his own entire sales department. Interestingly, it would be working within this job role that Nakayama would notice the potential of the arcade industry, so would pitch to his bosses that the company should refocus some of their resources and break into that market. In a story similar to so many that we have heard on here before, the older Japanese businessmen who ran the company, the V&V Trading Company, would sneer at Nakayama's idea and tell him to fall back in line and get on with his job, as they had no interest in lowbrow ideas such as amusements. What a bunch of short-sighted fuddy-duddies. Accepting that he had no chance in hell of convincing his bosses that he was right, and indeed they were the ones who were wrong, Nakayama would leave the company with four of their best salesmen in tow, whereby he would form his own company known as Esco Trading in 1967, who would operate as a successful distributor of coin-operated amusements. After over a decade of trade, Nakayama wanted a bigger distribution network. So, in 1979, to make this possible, ESCO would be purchased by Sega, with Nakayama hopping on board with them and becoming Vice President of Distribution, eventually helping Sega carve out a huge niche in the arcade industry. Nakayama's influence grew so strong that by 1983, he became Sega President and advocated for Sega to enter the still-growing Japanese home console market, birthing the SG-1000 and every single home console that would follow it. The first Sega console was released directly to compete with Nintendo's Famicom. This plan served a dual purpose, as not only would Sega get a footing in the console industry, but they could also hinder Nintendo's potential of expanding into their arcade patch. So the most epic console war in history was on. Next, an important point in today's plot would occur. Nakayama would appoint Tom Kalinske as CEO of Sega of America, who would make the Sega Genesis a massive success in the region, and later others. While Kalinske would ultimately achieve such a goal, what is interesting is that the board of directors in charge at Sega of Japan would attempt to veto Kalinsky's marketing plans, disallowing the bundling of the console with Sonic the Hedgehog and the aggressive advertising campaign that Kalinsky had put forward. Here, it is easy to infer that Hayao Nakayama may have very well reflected on his own past when dealing with such dismissive boards, as rather than simply letting the board quash the plans, like a board had done to him at the Hi-Fi company all of those years earlier. Instead, Nakayama would boldly overrule their decision, which would pave the way for the success of the Genesis, thus proving that if Nakayama had not stepped in, the board would have made an abysmal decision for the future of the company. 
During the 16-bit era of gaming, whereby Tom Kalinske would help make the 16-bit Sega console a massive success in both North America and Europe, it has been stated that staff working on the Japanese side of the company would look on all of this rather enviously, as the Mega Drive had never managed to find the same success levels in its home nation that it had managed to find under the direction of Tom Kalinske elsewhere. Genesis does what Mega didn't. And bear with me because context is everything when explaining the story of the isolation room before any degenerates start complaining and posting timestamps. It has been reported in the past that Nakayama would constantly chastise Sega of Japan staff along with the board by often ridiculing them for their inferior performances to that being achieved in the West which could be a tough pill for any employee to swallow anywhere. However, when we consider the Japanese working culture, it would be inferable that staff in this country would have been even more affected by this. It could very well have led to some of the animosity initially from the Japanese side to the Americans. You see, it is well documented that Japan has some of the longest work hours in the world. In fact, working long hours is a way of life in the country. Even to this day, more than one in four Japanese companies have their employees work over 80 hours overtime per month, often unpaid. It's actually considered unacceptable to leave an office in Japan before your boss does, even if your boss is choosing to work way past the statutory required paid hours. A key difference between Japan and most other developed nations is that corporate culture in Japan is driven by what is referred to by the so-called salary man. People are defined by their loyalty to the company they work for, often dedicating their entire working life to one organization. The Japanese work ethic went as far as to propel the country to become the world's second largest economy, which was partly achieved through a cultural emphasis that a company's success as a whole is much more important than any individual. Imagine working this hard and then just being told that you're rubbish compared to the Americans Oh, that must have done wonders for their mental health. Apart from Tom Kalinske and co seemingly making better decisions than that of staff from Sega of Japan, regardless of this, it is not surprising why an American wing of the company would have the edge over its Japanese counterpart. I mean, it doesn't exactly take a rocket scientist to realise that culturally, emotionally blackmailing staff to work more hours isn't going to result in optimum productivity long term. In fact, all you have to do is look at the state of the Japanese economy today and its sharp decline to see the evidence for yourself. Stress and burnout from workers has helped lead Japan to now have the lowest productivity out of any of the seven G7 nations, with just 44.5% of labour productivity GDP per hour worked, compared with the United States, 68.3. America, fuck yeah! This toxic working environment that long term results in diminishing returns meant that Sega of Japan never had a leg to stand on when it came to competing with the much healthier and more liberal Sega of America. So, within a flailing Sega of Japan throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, it seems to keep staff in line and more productive, like the work culture in general, they would opt for a stick over a carrot approach. Going back to the gaming related portion of this video, it was evident by 1995 that the Sega Mega Drive in Japan had failed to achieve the successes that the company had hoped for, with the corporation's new hopes instead being pinned on the new Sega Saturn. 
Sega of Japan would restructure their company completely. However, bizarrely, not one single staff member would be laid off through this period. It is said that instead, Sega would order their unwanted staff to resign from the company voluntarily or at the very least get a new job at one of their affiliate companies. However, for those who would refuse to quit their job, this tale, as promised, takes a rather dark turn. In a good case scenario for these staff, Sega would order their employees to stay at home all day, with 30% of their wages being cut. But for many, they would simply order them to stay in a confined room all day, being given zero work to do. Let's just remember that they weren't allowed to leave before their bosses did. The hope was that by severely mistreating their employees, said employees would choose to give up the one job that their culture told them they must work for the rest of their working lives or face social consequences and further humiliation and potentially become essentially unemployable as a result of leaving said job voluntarily. Sega employees who did not comply would regularly be sent to an isolation room, hoping that the Japanese company would be able to break their spirits. An article published in The Times in August of 1999 tells the story of an employee named Toshiyuki Sakai, who describes what it was like to be subjected to this practice. He states he was assigned to a desk in a windowless room at the head office, with no outside telephone line and no work to do. And that was when he knew that his days with Sega Enterprises were numbered. The Times outlines, workers were sent to this room, officially called the persona room, but known to employees as the company jail. When Sega had no further need for them and wanted them to quit, according to Mr. Sakai, a 35-year-old quality controller, a week or two idling in the room was enough to persuade most people to accept a voluntary retirement. However, Mr. Sakai endured three months of solitary, as he calls it, until Sega finally fired him in March for insufficient work ability. I never thought that, in a way, I'd be kind of glad that Sega lost the console war. News reports would shine a light on this corporate tactic, which is said to have even surprised many Japanese people. But according to the Times, what Mr. Sakai went through was far from a unique scenario, and the rabbit hole goes way deeper than just Sega when it comes to this sort of conduct. They would outlay in 1999 that most big Japanese companies shied away from making employees redundant, as it contradicted the nation's so-called jobs for life system, as rewarding loyalty with security was sacred. But as the dated article would highlight, the Japanese economy was falling, with restructuring being a must across the board. Looking back at this time of change in Japan, we can now see that eventually they would lose their second largest economy spot, being replaced with the emerging power of China in 2010. So Sega was right to be changing, they just did not go about it in a way that was even remotely appropriate. This alarming isolation trend of the period illustrates the company's ambivalence to harassment and cruelty to unwanted employees who were being deprived of their job, their desk and their dignity, with Japanese unions early on in the process accepting such abuse. And for what? So that their company didn't have to admit they needed to make staff redundant? What absolute horrifying negligence. A Sega spokesman known as Munehiro Umemura would speak up in 1999 in defence 
of isolating staff in the so-called persona rooms, stating, most of them had already decided to leave. Anyway, the media has reported the rooms as if they were company jails. Sega has never done anything to drive those in the rooms to leave the company. Yeah, alright. What a total bastard! Rather than surrender to Sega and start a new job, Mr Sakai would instead choose to take Sega to court, rightfully bitter at the way he was treated by a company to which he devoted nine years of his life. Reflecting on being put in one of the persona rooms, he states, it was really like an isolation ward. When the personnel department ordered me to spend the whole day there, I was close to tears, thinking of all I'd done for the company. At a later date, about 30 members from a Sega Union group protested outside of Sega headquarters, using megaphones to announce the evils of this Japanese practice. Additionally, members of the group passed out flyers to Sega employees. In 2001, it would be reported that the workers of Sega Enterprises Limited won their struggle against the gaming company's inhumane labour practices, making their solitary confinement rooms no more. The Japanese press would report that in an out-of-court agreement on the 17th of September 2001, the company would promise to stop using the isolation rooms and transfer their workers confined in the rooms to other sections of their business without lowering their previous working conditions. The promise would also provide jobs to five of the workers they had forced to stay home for over five months and pay them back the wages they had not received. They would also declare that they would dismiss workers going forward for company reasons to not hinder their future Japanese job prospects. I can't believe that something so outrageous would happen so recently in such a romanticised country. What is wrong with weebs? As for Hayao Nakayama, who was with the company when this restructuring process began in 1995, he would be gone from the company by 1997, so was not around for the removal of the Persona rooms. He would make a huge misjudgment by allowing the Sega Saturn to become Sega's next generation game console, which he had faith in succeeding around the world after its early successes in Japan. But as this video illustrates, Japan is drastically culturally different to the rest of the world, so the Saturn's success was no certainty. If that was not enough to drive him away from the company, many speculated that the failed Sega Bandai merger from 1997 certainly was. Nakayama elaborated on his reason for agreeing to cancel the acquisition of Bandai, stating, We will not be successful working together if Bandai's management cannot take hold of people's hearts. After that, he was out the door of Sega in 1998, with both the company and the nation's economy itself, both being in deterioration. Perhaps what is most intriguing about Nakayama's position at the top was that he was never your typical Japanese salaryman, and in fact the opposite. This was a man who went against the grain from day one of his career, opting to ditch his family tradition of medicine and leave college to become a salesman. This is before we even take into account that he would leave the hi-fi company whom he had a lifetime position with the very moment they would not embrace his arcade idea and would go on to be the same man who would go against the board at Sega in greenlighting the plans of Tom Kalinske. How very un-Japanese. If anyone should have understood the stereotypical way of doing business in Japan is perhaps not the best way to do things, it is Haya Nakayama. So it's sad in a way that he didn't come up with alternative methods to motivate his staff rather than bullying. But sadly, 
What is done is done. So that was the story of the infamous Sega Isolation Room. If you enjoyed this video, then subscribe, hit the notification bell, all of the usual call to actions that you get at the end of my video. And as always, I shall be answering a question now from one of my patrons. So just unlocking my phone. The question is from Anna Pan who asks when playing fighting games on consoles since you have every controller at your disposal do you play with the original consoles gamepad or the arcade pad i know the moves on the console controllers are better but always try to use the arcade pads well anna pan i'm not as sensible as you in the sense that I don't ever try to use an arcade pad. I just don't have the nostalgia for them. That's it. When I was little, I wasn't taking in arcades, basically, at all. So, for me, I the nostalgia isn't there. Uh, where the nostalgia is, though, is with the PlayStation. Because although I had access to earlier consoles, um, my access was extremely limited um, because it depended on whether my nan had bought a game or not, basically. Um, so my, my memories are playing Tekken 2 on the PlayStation. So for me, I liked it. They feel more natural. Fighting games feel more natural for me on a PlayStation with a PlayStation controller um, without, without the um, analog stick. And that's basically it really. So if you would like to have your question answered at the end of one of my videos, then please consider becoming a backer over on Patreon. Thank you so much for sticking around until this point of the video and I shall see you all in the next one.